Earlier this month, on June 6, the Resilience lunar lander attempted to softly touch down, but instead impacted the moon's surface at a high speed. At the time, we weren't provided any live images during the landing attempt, only telemetry, which gave insight into what went wrong, but not the whole picture. Over the past few days, however, teams working with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter released some of the first images showing the impact site and crater created by the landing attempt. iSpace also released an updated analysis on what they believe caused the hard impact. Here I'll go more in depth into the new images, the lander's distance from the targeted landing site, its final approach, and more. The first image, provided by the LRO team, shows the crater in the very center. For reference, this image width spans 1,040 meters on the lunar surface, and north is up. The crater formed as the vehicle impacted, excavated, and sent lunar regolith in each direction. They highlighted that the faint bright halo resulted from low-angle regolith particles scoring the surface. They also provided a before and after comparison that much more clearly shows the impact site and what's new. During the official livestream, the final speed measurement we got showed the lander traveling at 187 kilometers an hour, or just over 50 meters per second. Assuming it hit the surface at that speed, in addition to the crater, debris would be shot far in the direction it was traveling. That being said, the images from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter aren't detailed enough to spot any obvious debris. Fortunately, we also got images from India's Chandrayaan-2 orbiter. In the first close-up, you not only get a better view of the crater, but pieces of the spacecraft become obvious in the surrounding area. These shiny pieces are scattered all around the impact site and very significantly in size. Other images taken northeast of the impact site show more pieces of what are believed to be debris from the lunar lander. In one specific image showing the impact location and where debris is thought to be spotted, it highlights the distance some of these pieces traveled. Using this image as a guide and mapping some of the provided coordinates, it suggests that the furthest piece of spotted debris is just under 2 kilometers from the impact site. That debris field, crater, and final measurements from the lander suggest it was a very significant impact and not just a slightly hard landing. In a new statement released yesterday from iSpace, they're quoted saying, Through subsequent and further analysis of telemetry data acquired from the lander, confirmed that the technical cause of the hard landing was an anomaly in the laser rangefinder or LRF hardware. The review also confirmed the issue was not related to the landing guidance control software, nor was it caused by anomalies in the propulsion system or other systems, such as the power supply. In terms of what the cause of this was, they narrowed it down to two items they believe could be responsible. The first is a potential error in the installation direction during assembly, manufacturing and or testing, or abnormal attitude of the lander during descent. The second is deterioration of LRF performance during flight or performance that was lower than expected. They finished by saying, the review detected no errors in the installation direction during AIT or attitude abnormalities during descent. The review therefore concluded that the possibility of deterioration in the performance of the LRF during flight or the performance itself was lower than expected is high. This information, including implementing countermeasures and improvements, will be incorporated into planning for future missions, they said. At the time of the landing, there was very little data indicating the state of the lander. Even once they were aware that it was likely lost, the speed it hit the surface and the state of it weren't exactly clear. In a statement immediately after the landing attempt, the company was quoted saying, the lander descended from an altitude of approximately 100 kilometers to approximately 20 kilometers, and then successfully fired its main engine as planned to begin deceleration. While the lander's attitude was confirmed to be nearly vertical, telemetry was lost thereafter, and no data indicating a successful landing was received, even after the scheduled landing time had passed. The last comment was, based on the currently available data, the Mission Control Center has been able to confirm the following. The laser rangefinder used to measure the distance to the lunar surface experienced delays in obtaining valid measurement values. As a result, the lander was unable to decelerate sufficiently to reach the required speed for the planned lunar landing. In the most recent statement, they did clarify that they're now going to launch an external review task force, including third-party experts. This should provide more information in future months to try and ensure a similar issue doesn't happen in the future. Focusing back on the images, using coordinates for the planned general landing site and where the lander impacted the surface, we can get a better idea of its accuracy. Mapped out, you can see both points with the top one being where they wanted to land and the bottom the impact site. The distance between the two is exactly 1.7 kilometers. That being said, it was less of a specific landing location and more of a large area that they were targeting. That landing area is in a volcanic region interspersed with large-scale faults known as wrinkle ridges. This area formed over 3.5 billion years ago as massive basalt eruptions flooded low-lying terrain. Later, the wrinkle ridges formed as the crust buckled under the weight of the heavy basalt deposits. With these images, we can also compare them to the impact site of iSpace's first lunar landing attempt back in 2023. For reference, on M1, the lander began the descent sequence from an altitude of approximately 100 kilometers above the lunar surface. At the end of the planned landing sequence, it approached the lunar surface at a speed of less than 1 meter per second. 
the operation was confirmed to have been in accordance with expectations until about 1.43 a.m., which was the scheduled landing time. During that period of descent, an unexpected behavior occurred with the lander's altitude measurement. While the lander estimated its own altitude to be zero or on the lunar surface, it was later determined to be at an altitude of approximately 5 kilometers above the surface. After reaching the scheduled landing time, the lander continued to descend at a low speed until the propulsion system ran out of fuel. At that point, the controlled descent of the lander ceased, and it's believed to have free-fallen to the moon's surface. On that first mission, based on the review of the flight data, it was observed that as the lander was navigating to the planned landing site, the altitude measured by the onboard sensors rose sharply when it passed over a large cliff approximately 3 kilometers in elevation on the lunar surface, which was determined to be the rim of a crater. This basically tricked the lander and was responsible for its destruction. It was said to have impacted the surface traveling around 90 meters per second. This translates to about twice as fast as the final telemetry provided to us regarding the M2 lander's speed. After the M2 mission, iSpace's founder and CEO was quoted saying, Given that there is currently no prospect of a successful lunar landing, our top priority is to swiftly analyze the telemetry data we have obtained thus far and work diligently to identify the cause. We will strive to restore trust by providing a report of the findings to our shareholders, payload customers, Hakuda our partners, government officials, and all supporters of space, he said. While these first two iSpace missions haven't gone exactly to plan, the company still has multiple future missions in the works. In early 2024, the company raised around $53.5 million, with the majority of that funding planning to go toward Mission 3. For Mission 3 and beyond, iSpace wants to increase the frequency of lunar landings and rover expeditions to transport customer payloads to the moon. In a quote, they said, Our landers will deploy swarms of rovers to the lunar surface to pioneer the discovery and development of lunar resources, enabling the steady development of lunar industry and human presence on the moon. As far as the impact of the recent mission on future attempts, in a final statement, the company said, Based on the technical analysis and improvement plan, the reselection of landing sensors such as LRFs and the review and expansion of testing are estimated to increase combined development costs by a maximum of approximately 1.5 billion yen, or $10.3 million for Mission 3 and Mission 4. These costs are expected to be recognized on a phase basis during the period leading up to the planned launches in 2027. There is no expected impact on the current launch schedule for Missions 3 and 4, they said. Obviously, this increase in cost and possibly timeline is not ideal, but iSpace seems to already be working on the next planned missions. In the last week or so, we not only got new images of the Resilience Impact Site, but also details from the company. Both highlight a high-speed impact, and the current understanding is that it was related to the lander's laser rangefinder, which suffered an anomaly. We will have to wait and see how it progresses, and the impact it has on the space industry. Thank you very much for watching.